Good evening, everyone. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I'm so excited to, to welcome you to tonight's webinar featuring the always amazing Nancy Kane from Harvard Business School. Thanks for taking the time to attend. Um, a little bit of background about FAN. We're a nonprofit organization that presents a high quality speaker series free to the public on topics related to all aspects of human development, mental health, education, social justice, all kinds of topics. We have about 100 videos of past events that are archived on our website and our YouTube channel. So please be sure to explore. All right, so now let's just jump in. So tonight marks Professor Nancy Kane's third appearance for FAN, and we are humbled and grateful to be graced once again with her time and attention. Um, you can view recordings of Nancy's previous FAN events on our YouTube channel. Um, I think we're gonna put probably some links in chat so you can do that easily. Uh, since March of this year, since COVID shutdown, I want to bring to your attention that Professor Kane has been posting daily uh, what she's been uh, labeling leading yourself in crisis insights on social media. Uh, we've done you an incredible favor of collating them. I believe there's, <laughs> now she's laughing. I believe there's 185 of them as of today. Uh, and we collated it into a PDF and we're going to put it in chat. You are very lucky people, though I would say follow Nancy on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and get those for you every single day. I read them every single day religiously. Uh, in addition to her work as a historian and the James E. Robinson Chair of Business Administration at Harvard Business School, uh, Nancy has coached leaders from many organizations and has spoken at the World Economic Forum in Davos, the Aspen Ideas Festival, and the World Business Forum as one of the nation's thought leaders on the topic of crucible leadership. She has been a shiny beacon throughout these days and months of national crises and turmoil. Uh, Nancy will offer about a 30 minute talk and then she's gonna be joined on screen for an interview by Manuel Cuevas Trisan, Vice President and Chief Human Resource Op Officer at Northwestern University. We look forward to an incredibly sparky and insightful conversation between the two of them in the second half of this program. It is now uh, beyond my most incredible pleasure ever uh, to welcome back probably one of my, and all you other fan speakers, cover your ears right now, but probably one of my most favorite human beings on the planet, Professor Nancy Kane. Nancy, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk for about 30 minutes and Manuel and I are gonna talk and I hope we're gonna talk in questions and answers about the emotional roller coaster of COVID. I am a historian who studies leaders in crisis, leaders in long, slow burn crises, not leaders at Three Mile Island or leaders in yeah, Hurricane sure. Katrina, as important as that work is. I study long crises and I study how individuals respond to that and how they make themselves better in crises. So I have studied lots of different aspects of emotional behavior on the part of people as diverse as Abraham Lincoln, Catherine Graham, Greta Thunberg, um, Frederick Douglass, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Nelson Mandela. I've been studying this indirectly for a long time um, in, as a way of understanding how these people grounded themselves and didn't shrink, how they got better, how they got more courageous and more resilient. I'm gonna talk about resilience in a minute. Um, so I knew something about this kind of coming at it askance from the side, but in the six months, it seems like six, 60 years since the lockdown, my work, which has been with all kinds of organizations, from art museum directors to, to firefighters to doctors and, and EMT workers to executives to philanthropists, all this work I've done talking to people about crisis leadership, increasingly, with every week, the drumbeat of what about, how do we deal with the anxiety? How do we keep ourselves grounded? How do I keep my team grounded has grown. So I put this webinar together when Lonnie said, what would you like to do a second webinar on? So this is really the first time I've put these pieces together. I hope it's helpful. And like my webinar I did uh, in July, this is not a set of historical insights. This is a set of what you might call rules of the road, tricks of the trade, tools to get, to get through this and get stronger in the doing. Um, and you'll choose as you hear them, what has resonance for you, for you. None of these are rocket science. I increasingly see my work as a coach and a scholar, leadership scholar, as helping people rediscover something they knew already, right? Remember that line from Little Gidding from Eliot, um, but we shall not seek from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to find ourselves at the place we started and to know it for the first time. I think what I do is help people know 
what they need to do and what they can do to get themselves even stronger and even more firmly on the higher road. So a couple of introductory comments, and then I'm going to just give you a series of tools, what, many of which you're already using, some of which you may not be, and, and some of which you may need validation to use with new vigor or compliance. First, I said this at the top of the last webinar, it bears repeating because we're so wrong in terms of how we're acting and thinking about the right frame on this crisis. This is a seismic event. This is not something we should be trying to grab back pieces of normality for and getting frustrated because we don't seem to be getting there. That's our fault, right? We are being destabilized because we have a wrong frame on this moment. Not just COVID, right? Not just the enemy. I said in, the, in our first webinar during the COVID time that this was akin to a world war and we're fighting a viral enemy rather than a coalition of nation states, an efficient, ruthlessly effective and very fast re replicating enemy. Um, but, but in a world war, we wouldn't be saying, oh gosh, we thought the war would be over this week or next month or next season. We'd be thinking about what the post-war world was like and we need to really, we're really doing ourselves and, and, and both the, the economic and the medical crisis and the campaign for, for justice and equality that has been long simmering and has burst out with an extraordinary moment of opportunity. We're doing all those things a terrible disservice by really, really trying to belittle their importance. This is seismic. And if we start thinking that, that we're not at the end, and we're not, I'm paraphrasing Churchill here, at the end of the beginning, the, at the beginning of the end, but perhaps at the end of the beginning, and that we will get through this, we are getting through it, present participle. Maybe we can start like doing smarter things and breathing a little more easily and feeling a lot less stressed. So we got the wrong frame. It's a war and we don't get through wars in a season or two. Um, first observation. Second observation, I just say we are getting through it. You know, and, and the fact that we don't have enough inspirational and credible, credibly hopeful leadership in, in enough places on the national scene does not in any way give us license to abdicate our responsibility to realize we are getting through it. Our kids are getting through it. Our aging parents, my mother is in assisted living facility about 30 miles from here. She is getting through it. We are getting through it. And we, most of us on this call, are not among the most vulnerable. And so if we want to get anxious, let's at least channel some of that anxiety to the people who don't have the resources of all kinds that we do, but we are getting through it, second observation. Now, third observation, again, I ask us to just draw a breath in and, take, and, and let it out. Here, I think it's important to name it. Here are some of the sources of stress. So we wonder why we're all anxious. We're all anxious. And those mental health numbers, these deteriorating indices of mental health have a lot to do with these forces, okay? First, the virus is still spreading rapidly, right? In 33 states, according to the Washington Post information, more trustworthy than CDC information, according to the Washington Post information today, in 33 states, the virus positivity rates are greater than 10%, all the way up to 67% than they were last week. So the virus is still spreading rapidly in more than half the states. Compliance from at some aggregate, but a lot of collected anecdotal data is slipping because we're tired. Um, second source of stress, fall is arriving. And unlike most Septembers, when we might put a little pep in our stuff because it's new school, it's new school shoes and it's shopping for our kids like school supplies and thinking about apple picking and pumpkin buying, right? It doesn't, it doesn't have quite that same seasonal change welcoming aspect to it because fall may mean lots of potential outdoor fall activities with heat lamps and warm clothes, but mostly it means we're going to move indoors in a lot of parts of the country much more frequently than we did before. And that's a problem, Houston, because the coronavirus loves it when we move indoors. Um, we have ongoing volatility, fourth source of stress, or maybe it's the fifth, meaning it's incredibly hard to plan. It's hard to plan anything. It's hard to plan a week from now. It's hard to plan two days from now, much less plan what in the heck we're gonna do over the next six months. And, and that's true in so many ways. And for 
almost all of us, not everyone, but almost all, many more people than not, the vast majority of people, that actually causes more stress. Um, now I'm going to move into a couple of large scale sources of stress that I, they have to be named. Uh, stress, source of stress number six, they're the, the, the ongoing relative ineffectiveness of so many public leaders. Um, I'm not talking about everyone. I was, we, got, we talked last time in July about lots of people doing the Lord's work in their positions of leadership, but we don't see enough of it. And, and the ongoing drumbeat of corruption and to, Lonnie started off the pre-call conversation talking about the headline of the New York Times, which just went up about CDC recommendations that went out against all the so many agencies, so, the, so many agency scientists' objections. So everywhere we look, we don't know what to trust. And bastions, formerly trustworthy bastions institutionally, are, are, are ever less trustworthy. And that is a real source of stress. I think this is like an enormously important thing we're not talking enough about. So that leads lots of thinking people, like the people on this call or in this room, to wonder who are we as a people? What are we as a polity? And what about our most vulnerable members? And why can't we take better care of them? One in five American children, my friends, is hungry. That is something to be really ashamed of to feel what you know, Brene Brown likes to talk about, the cleansing value of shame. So that, I think this is a really important source of stress added on to the widespread suffering that undergirds our inability to take good care of our vulnerable and to make many more people more vulnerable. Uh, last but not least, I think, is the election and all that's up for grabs here. This is truly, right, the, uh, the most important election in the history of America. It's more important than 1860. I wouldn't have said that five months ago, but it is. Um, and and, and we, there's everything to be lost and, and, and everything with the potential to be saved. It's a bifurcated distribution. So I'm done there. Lots of stress. So if you're feeling stressed, you're feeling anxious, you're fighting with your partner or your mother or your parents or your kids more often than usual, please welcome to the club. The door is open. We're all here with you because we are stressed and we, and, we are, and we are reacting to that stress in ways that aren't always very helpful to us. Not because we're not strong and not because we're not good, but because there's so much pounding at us. And, and we, again, we are the lucky, all right? So let me pause there and now I'm gonna offer you some, what I hope will be some useful possibilities. I wanna start with resilience, a word very, very attractive right now, but not necessarily well understood. So resilience is defined as the ability to get stronger, to be better, to, be, to see things more clearly, and to be more ready for the next difficulty, all in the face of adversity. The ability to get better, in a sense, stronger, more clear, see things more clearly, right? Be more, be more ready for the next disaster in the face of great adversity. Now, resilience, very attractive, very important. We need it now. We want in March, whatever's coming in March, because we won't be anywhere near over in March. Let's not, let's be truthful. Um, we want it actually to be easier in March, whatever comes at us, than it is right now. And may it be, be easier now than it was in April. That's resilient. That's, that's an aspect of resilience. And everyone I have studied in terms of worthy, serious leaders, what I defined in the first um, webinars, real leaders, individuals who help us overcome the limitations of our own weaknesses and selfishness, and laziness and fears and get us to do harder, better things than we can get ourselves to do on our own. Every one of those people discovered their resilience muscle. Now, resilience is not something we get on an app. I will tell you, dear friends, I think apps are great for compliance. I don't think they're actually very good for actually helping you through these practices. So let me just say that as a historian and something of a Luddite. I don't think they, they did demonstrate the kind of effectiveness we'd like. But you can't get resilience on an app. And you're not endowed with it because your mother had it, right? Resilience is a function, believe it or not. And I, this work comes out of the field of positive psychology, the chief paterfamilias of which is, uh, is, is a man named Martin Seligman, still hard at work doing research on all kinds of aspects of positive psychology, particularly resilience. And here's what the essence of his findings on resilience are. And this is why this is what I want you to take in. 
whether you are you can find resilience in the in the in the in the face of real adversity or the next wave coming at you is a function of how you explain the crisis to yourself and your children to yourself and your team to yourself and your organization to yourself and your family what do i mean by that people tend in a crisis to, to walk through one of two explanatory doors the first the more productive the one that leads down the hallway the resilience hallway is this crisis is limited in scope. It's limited in scope. It's maybe widespread like COVID, but it's not everything. It's not everything. It's limited in scope. Second explanatory criterion or factor, buttress, it is not going to last forever. It is not the rest of my life. And third, equally important explanatory factor, I am not the sole or even the primary cause of this crisis. So three things, right? Limit, limited in scope, with limits, not gonna last forever and not my, my primarily my fault, okay? And we've all been through both these doors, but one door leads you to a good place and one door helps you wither and it's a bifurcated distribution. Second, second door, right? Oh my God, my life is ruined. Everything is affected. My life as I knew it is over. Second explanatory factor, my entire future is determined. There is, this will never end. Everything is, everything is affected and, 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 and it will never ever be over for me. All these terrible things, dominoes will fall as a result. Third explanatory factor, I'm jinxed. If this is a judgment from God. I knew this would happen to me. That's why Harold Kushner wrote why bad things happen to good people because of this aspect of people's way of explaining bad times. So think about how you're framing this for yourself because one way leads to getting stronger, better, right? More clear thinking, more grounded, right? And in some cases, in the case of like Rachel Carson, just really finding your superpower. The other leads to hunkering down. There's a very specific response hierarchy with resilience. And it begins at the bottom with avoid, survive, cope, manage, harness. So if you want to have any chance of managing and harnessing this, you want to really be thinking every day, explaining this thing through door number one rather than door number two. Okay, that's resilience. And, that's, and, and I've seen this work over and over and over with all kinds of people. So think about how you're explaining this crisis to your kids and yourself every day. Second piece, I said this earlier, so I'm going to be very brief here. Second tool, how are, you, how are you talking about this? How are you talking about the crisis? Are you talking about, well, we should be back to normal? Or, gosh, we're, hybrid, we're, we're remote now. When are we going to go to hybrid? No. No. I mean, you, you, you just have to plan. And, of course, these, this, these changes, all this volatility matters. But that's not getting through the crisis. The crisis is we're in this amazing shoot, this extraordinary set of events, it's not going to end soon. How do I want, picture yourself five years from now, in a, in looking back at this seismic event. It will be over in five years, well over. How do you want to remember what you did, how you showed up, what happened to you over the year and a half or two years of this crisis? Put yourself five years forward and look backward. Like all those veterans, like all those folks that fed hobos on their back doorsteps during the Great Depression, how are you going to talk about it? How are you going to remember it? And I'm not talking about sugarcoating the memory. So that's a good way to help you as you talk to your children or your employees or your students, think about that. So framing it, right, and putting yourself forward to look back on a seismic event can be very, very useful. Third, I talked about this, so I'll be very brief here. I talked about this a lot in the first video, in the first webinar. And I, and I talked about it, I talk about it a lot in the Leading Yourself in Crisis. So you can see it with um, Lonnie's PDF. But how you, what I like to say, put your oxygen mask on first, right? You put it on first and then you help others. How you take care of yourself, feeding yourself, watering yourself, sleeping. I did four, five post yesterday about, about putting, getting yourself ready to get a good night's sleep. And that's, that's now the way my work happens. It's that tactile in my work because your sleep has a huge amount to do with your response, your anxiety level, your sense of empowerment, 
your sense of being grounded. So getting good sleep is really important. And if you look at the post from yesterday, you can see these five or six well tested. I can't claim no credit for them. Things. So, but this aspect of feeding, watering yourself, and two other aspects that are really important here that don't get mentioned enough. You need recovery every day. Parents need this. Manuel needs this. Leaders like Manuel need this. Everybody needs recovery. And recovery isn't, oh, I think I'll get up from my computer at, or my checking account where I'm paying bills online and go empty the dishwasher. That's not recovery. Recovery is when you leave all the different kinds of work in your life behind and you maybe and your kids go out and like toss the football on the front lawn. Or, you know, I know so I'm just talking to a guy um, at a high tech company who loves electric guitar and he goes down in the basement and his wife puts earplugs in and he like, you know, strums his feather. His, 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 his electric guitar, I can't remember, Fenta Stratocaster, I've got it wrong, but he, Eric Clapton's guitar. So whatever it is, you need 20 minutes of real recovery where your heart can skip and sing. Something that brings you joy. That is extraordinary, an extraordinary tonic against getting spinning, against the kind of anxiety that's buffeting us all the time. And, and, and so, so preventing us, so getting in the way of our showing up a little bit better more often than we do right now. So you need recovery and you need walking. <laughs> I am now five months, six months into the crisis, sure that walking is, is the most, one of the most important medicines Americans' mental health can take. I don't care whether you walk the halls. I don't care whether you walk around your front yard 30 times. I don't care whether you walk the dog. You just need to walk because it turns out it really, really helps you unlock the mind remove yourself from the pounding stress, often discover some nature and, and just see a larger picture. You gotta walk, you gotta walk, you gotta walk. And it doesn't matter when, this, that you do it several times a day. You don't, need to be, you don't need to go into walking marathons, but you need to walk. Okay, some other things that we haven't talked so much about. I write a lot in this last book, Forged in Crisis, about how all these people, notice by the way that things I'm suggesting to you are rooted mostly in emotional awareness and self-discipline, the two pillars of really leading well. Self-mastery, self-monitoring, you call it what you want, but self-discipline is what I call it. So rule number, I think we're in rule number six, but it may be five. You have to, I write a lot in the book about how most of these people learn in high stakes situations not to actually act out when their emotional temperature soared, right? Suddenly shot up, they got angry, they got scared, they got frustrated. And they all learned to get enough control of themselves that they didn't, as a psychotherapist would say, act out on the emotion. And that turns out to be incredibly important in high stakes situations, just recall John Kennedy in the Cuban Missile Crisis to take a tiny weenie example. Um, but we all need that. And what the, it's not, does not mean these leaders, by the way, didn't have those emotions and it doesn't mean they, that they did nothing with them. They just held them and found a trusted place to release them or a trusted person to release them with. So I ask you now, as part of your homework here, to think about what are the ways that I can really let this stress rip out of me? Whatever it is, I personally discovered during my second bout with cancer that I would fall on the, kitchens, fall on the kitchen floor at 11 p.m. and I would howl. I would howl to the heavens, I would howl to hell, I would just howl, and I still do this. I still allow myself to howl when it get, the pressure builds too high. My dogs think I'm nuts, I live in a house, so I don't, have, I don't have neighbors yelling at me, but whatever it is, that is such a release. Whatever it is, you need the most powerful release, and you need to give yourself permission to use it on a regular basis, not necessarily every day, but when you need it, you need to get to that trusted place or that trusted person and let it rip. So, so think about that. Um, okay, now a few real quick ones. Small acts of kindness, tiny acts of service turn out to be great, just great valves on releasing stress. You know, letting the person in when you're driving to work. Um, leaving extra tips in the jar at Starbucks if you're going into Starbucks. Um, you know, just bringing, I, I, bringing a, 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 a pie, I'm taking a homemade pie to a colleague, I'll drop it off on his doorstep because we're, we're social distancing, but small acts of service, small acts of kindness, the more the merrier, all actually take you out 
of the pounding stress of your moment and of your, your, your world and release some stress. And there's all kinds of amazing evidence, both qualitative and quantitative about that. So small acts of service are helping you as much as they're helping the person you're serving. Uh, rule number, uh, tool number eight, I'm a great believer in gratitude. Now I'm not the, I'm a little bit of a cobbler's, you know, kids have no shoes on this because I, I fall out of my habit here. But many years ago, I discovered through a colleague of mine at the school who was teaching a course on authentic leadership that if you, had, before you go to sleep each night, if you just in your mind, make note of three things you're grateful for. So I'm grateful that my dogs were so good on that walk with the puppy. I'm grateful that my trainer, my horse trainer was really nice to me in my lesson today and told me I did a great job. I'm just grateful that that hawk is still raising her young in the field across the street. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful that Joe Biden, in my case, did such a great job, right, at that, at, at that campaign stop. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But the thing about gratitude is, again, it takes you out of all the difficulties and into some of the goodness. And once you start doing this, not only does it help you fall asleep, but what it starts you the next day actually starting. If you do this a few days, you start looking for things to be grateful for during your day, and it, and it reframes things. So consider three gratitudes at night before you sleep, and consider doing that for a few days and then watching what happens. Um, keep telling, this is rule number, I guess, eight, nine. Keep telling the story of how you're navigating COVID to yourself. And, and keep adding chapters as you go, oh, yeah, gosh, we were really having a hard time in May with this. But actually, now we're getting pretty, be pretty much better. And now I've managed to see my mother, and I'm doing this. Keep telling the chapters of you and your team, you and your family, you and your organization. Keep telling so every week you, you add a chapter because that is also part of, build, of harnessing the resilience muscle and helping you realize what you have already done as opposed to what isn't happening next week or next month to get us back to where we used to be because folks, we're never going back. So tell the story as you go and keep logging how far you've come. Rule number nine, rediscover the humanities. Uh, a Tale of Two Cities, Ta-Nehisi Coates, James Baldwin, William Shakespeare, Jane Austen, Gustav Mahler, uh, the Dutch masters, peaceful landscapes, the humanity. Like we were just talking in the pre-call about John Singer Sargent and this painting behind me, painted by a sergeant-like sergeant artist in Boston. The thing about the, the, the humanities, they ask the questions that transcend the crises. They bring us back to what connects us across time, and, 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 and na national boundaries and race and religion and sexual orientation, what does it mean to be human? Because that has not changed even in this difficult moment. So rediscover the humanities and help your children do the same. Um, practice listening well. When you find yourself at three o'clock, just kind of, this is, this, is, this is a typical kind of, this is my uh, a, a, a representation of me about 3.30 on, some, on weekdays when there's so much coming and, I'm, and I've, I've looked at the news, I'm coming back to the news in just a second and we're gonna open it up for questions. But, but this, is, this is how I get, I get kind of a little bit spinny, a little bit restless inside. I'm not thinking very clearly, even though I'm trying to play the video game of multitasking, which we know empirically doesn't work. And, and what I learn is that when someone says something to me, if I, if I just snap self-discipline, snap myself away from my device, turn and listen and say, as Eckhart Tolle once said in The Power of Now, listen with your whole body. If I can get myself just for a moment to do that, I come back to ground zero. I come back to grounding. I come back to myself. So it's always trying to remember who said it was a great American theologian it wasn't Merton said Paul Tillich uh, actually a German emigre from the Nazis American theologian who became an American theologian the first duty of love is to listen practice listening and watch what happens to your anxiety levels two more um, say 
the emotional attributes you need out loud. Out loud, out loud, in the morning, in the evening, walking your dog, out loud. This is, this is really transformational. Stay grounded, Nancy. Stay focused. Listen. Breathe. Put your shoulders back and tighten your core. Say it. Say it. The saying out loud is like what Mandela once said. We talked about this a couple months ago. Uh, you know, courage isn't the absence of fear. It's the moving into the fear, taking the first step, and then realizing that you can put your shoulders back and you hold your core, core tight. And, and the act of doing that actually causes the fear not to be, to, not to be gone, not to completely fall away, but to go down enough that you realize, oh, I can do the next thing. I can take the next action and, and, and then take the action after that. So, so the ability to say it out loud and tighten your core and put your shoulders back, a bit of showing up as we talked about last time, actually really, really helps you be what you're saying you should be. Last thing. Last thing, you all know this, so let me say it, but let me say it. I wrote a, a lesson about this a couple of days ago. You need a meeting with yourself. You need a couple of them every day. You know, I was watching, um, two nights ago, I was watching, uh, I was reading, I'm reading about the, I'm writing a book on the, civil, on the civil rights movement, and I just started it, and I was reading about the Freedom Rides. I'm heavily invested in 1961 right now, and there's a, uh, in 2011, Oprah Winfrey brought a whole bunch of Freedom Riders, 50th anniversary, to her show. She was still doing her talk show. And she brought John Lewis on, um, really one of the most famous Freedom Riders. And, and it, was, it was just this kind of astounding set of pe reminiscences. And, and she also brought on a gentleman who beat John Lewis with a baseball bat, a Ku Klux Klan member, back in Birmingham in, in May of 1961 when they got off the bus there. And the guy had come to Lewis to apologize like four years before, come to his congressional office. And they'd hugged and, made, and really, really found a, a kind of shared humanity. And he was there on the set, on the Oprah set. And, and Oprah asked John Lewis, so she said, what do you do? And what the gentleman said, the Southern gentleman, was not loquacious and hardly out for like collective redemption. That wasn't why he was there. He said, the reason I wanted to apologize to you is I will never forget what you said to me as I was hitting you, you said to me as I was hitting you and you were falling on your knees, you said, I wish the love, I wish you the love for me that I have for you. And so Oprah turns to John Lewis and says, what are you doing? What were you thinking when people were beating you and you're able to say something like that? He said, and Lewis said in his inimitable way, I was having an executive session with myself. And I think we all need executive sessions. We don't need to find that kind of strength and, and virtue, although May God give us his grace to do that or her grace to do that. But we do need time with ourselves. We need time every day with ourselves in the shower, on the way to work, on a walk. We need time to, 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 to frame, to regroup, to pat ourselves on the head and say we are doing this and it's hard. And to say, and what, how can I help someone else get through this? Because our best hope of helping ourselves is actually helping others. So we need meetings with ourselves to collect ourselves. All right, I'm going to stop there, uh, and we're going to open it. Manuel and I are going to talk, and then we're going to have some time for questions. So I hope that's helpful. Um, but take a few of these out for a test drive and see and see whether they work for you. Hello, Nancy. How are you? I'm well, Manuel. Excellent. I'm glad to be here, and it's an absolute honor to uh, get to chat with you in this forum. So uh, I actually would like to start with the end uh, of, your, of your remarks when you talk uh, a little bit about having executive session or holding executive session with uh, yourself. And earlier in your remarks, you spoke about the inner narrative of a leader, uh, whether it is a parent, whether a head of state, uh, an office manager, uh, in the context of a crisis and in our context, in the context of a multitude or a confluence of crisis. Uh, what I would like to explore with you is, uh, since you have studied such uh, wonderful uh, leaders of the past, and most of the focus on those leaders is in the 
results in the outcomes. You are talking today about the inner life and about that inner narrative. Can you give examples of uh, some of the leaders that you studied, how that narrative evolved through crisis, through doubt, through tribulation? Sure. So let me start with Abraham Lincoln, who I know the best of all the leaders I've studied, because he helped me through a series of personal crises, learning, learning about his strength and his ability to get better from the inside out. Because my argument, Manuel, and all, the, all my work, and when I offer this to you folks, isn't, isn't just about trying to, to help you. I want to help you because you're leaders. Everyone on this call is a leader of some size or shape, of some organization, of some family. And my work is to help good leaders get even better. So I believe it all starts with this inner, this inner transformation, which begins, by the way, with a commitment to say, all hell is breaking loose. And somehow, by hook or crook, although I have no idea how, I am, I am going to get, I'm going to rise to the challenge. That's the first thing. I'm going to rise to the challenge. Not that I'm going to necessarily leap tall buildings in single bound. None of this is about that. It's all about these small, iterative, tiny steps we take. And then over time, we're able to take bigger steps because we're building now on something that's very powerful within us. So Lincoln, for example, you know, started out very, very anxious. He spent the first month of the war, which began in April of 1861, basically paralyzed, not able to make a decision about what to do about this fort in, in the Charleston, South Carolina harbor called Sumter. And, and, and then over time, and, and he also started out as someone who was, said, I won't touch slavery in any place where it's legal. And over the ensuing, say, first year and a half of the war, partly by virtue, I think, of the sheer raw bloodshed, the terror the terrible nature, the shock and awe of the Civil War. He came to think, I think, within himself first, right? This is my responsibility. What are we fighting for? Yes, we want to save the Union, but what kind of Union? And what lies, what's the weakest, most, if you will, you know, dark side of our Union? And over the first two years of the war, he came to see that. He would get clearer and clearer and stronger and stronger about the truth of the rest of the war. And it was slavery. And then, in, 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 a, in, a, in a country created so all men could, and women could be created equal or created equal, that couldn't exist. And so, but it had to happen for Lincoln first. It didn't happen in a grand political way, and then he figured out how to, you know, kind of buy into the package he was offering. It happened inch by inch within him, and every time, he in a sense said, "No, we will fight this war, even at this terrible cost." in order to make America better, to transform the union, each time he could do that, he got more resilient, more able to do it. So that by the time we get to the summer of 1864, which is bloody beyond belief, and Lincoln's going to be defeated because the North isn't winning, and, um, and the Democrats are going to win the White House, and they're going to keep the country split in two, or they're going to restore slavery. Lincoln is able to weather that summer without caving. He comes close. He never does without caving in a way that simply wouldn't have been possible four years earlier. So his resilience, his sense of mission, his sense of responsibility to uh, uh, carry out that mission, his ability, dear friends, to feed and water himself so he didn't cave physically or emotionally, because he was very vulnerable and he came very close. But his ability to do that every day and re recover, it was really, he got all those things added up to the, to the American Civil War being won by the North and slavery ending forever, the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, which makes all Americans Americans, and the 15th Amendment, which grants suffrage to African-American males, were all Lincoln's, they were all his children. They were not the function, they were ratified, two of them late after he died, but they were his babies, and they're the product of a man first who transformed himself and how that transformation had external impact. So thank you for that. And, 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 and speaking of that, I, I thought, um, I, in fact, I, I confess I wasn't a, um, an expert, nowhere near an expert on Frederick Douglass. But when you spoke now about Lincoln's own evolution and earlier in your remarks uh, about the importance of listening, of listening actively, uh, I kept thinking about the not just what you listen to, but who you listen, who you listen to. to. Would you care to comment a little bit about uh, that binomial uh, between 
um, that you've written extensively about uh, between Douglas and Lincoln and their relevance today. Absolutely. So one of the things that I don't think has ever been said, or not clearly enough said in the very, very well-trafficked, well-researched world of both slavery, the history of slavery and the history of the Civil War, is that Lincoln and Frederick Douglass were really bookends of the transformation of America. We give Lincoln too much credit at Douglass's expense because what Douglass did, and, and they would come, they were, these were too many really Lincoln didn't know much about Douglas. Douglas thought Lincoln was a compromiser and weak all the way up to the Emancipation Proclamation. And over the last three years of the war, they become to be more than respectful of each other. They become to be friends. Douglas is the first African-American, not a servant, to be invited into the White House um, and, on several occasions. And, and what's so interesting about the two of them, and both of whom would come to listen very, very strongly in really powerful ways to the other person through the last three years of the war, is that Douglas did mo more of the groundwork for the Emancipation Proclamation, the political groundwork with elites, with African-American citizens, with white Northerners, with reporters. He, more than any other activist, laid the political kindling that Lincoln had to have in order to promulgate the Emancipation Proclamation. So without all the work that Douglas had been doing for 15 years, listening carefully, speaking well, but listening carefully, Lincoln could never have done that. And of course, the history would have been different. So we really need to have a bookshelf with those two men at either end and call it the end of slavery uh, and the attempted transformation of America. One last thing about listening well. So in 1864, it's August, the Union armies are absolutely stalled. Sherman, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman outside of Atlanta and um, Ulysses Grant outside of Petersburg um, near Richmond in Virginia. And it's really clear that the, that the Democrats are gonna win and Lincoln's done. And, and he gets very, very frightened about losing. And he comes to think that he's gonna have to figure out a way before he loses the presidency to negotiate a peace with the Southern, with the Southern government, with the Confederate government. And, he, and he, he, he writes a little letter to a, 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 a liaison with, the, with um, Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, and he puts it in his drawer, and Frederick Douglass is coming to see him for a different, more complicated reason. I wish I could explain it to you because it's so fascinating, but we don't have time. And Lincoln asks him, Mr. Douglass, would you send this letter? So it's like, I mean, it's like a huge amount hinges on whether Lincoln sends this letter. And Douglass says, absolutely not, Mr. President. It would destroy the legacy you're trying to create of a, of a, of a, of a country in which slavery is over, and you would be damned in eternity if you did. And Lincoln folded up the letter, and it was found after he died. So these, this idea that who you listen to and when can be exceptionally powerful is perfectly illustrated there. Wonderful. Do you have a, among the leaders that you've studied or even people that are in your circle, a favorite listener and why do you think they're your favorite? You know, I, I'm there, well, I mean, I'm, I'm so lost now in the, in, 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 the, in 1961, 1962, and 1963, I mean, these, these activists, these brave young people, we know the names of Lewis, and we know Abernathy, and we know King, and we know Andrew Young. We don't know a lot of other people like Fred Shuttlesworth or Diane Nash or C.T. Vivian. Well, we know C.T. Vivian or, uh, you know, Bernard Lafayette. These are all these extraordinary, Bernard Zwang, all these extraordinary people who, who went, all of them went, all these people went to register, help people register to vote, except for King, he didn't physically do that. But they were such good listeners. They were such good listeners. So they knew before they started a campaign in a particular city, it was so strategic, it was so well planned, much, much more sophisticated than most of us know today. They, what they knew about what they could do successfully and how to do it, they knew because they'd listened so well. Uh, not only to the African, black Americans in that place, but to lots and lots of different, often racist, mostly racist whites. So the civil rights campaign of all those years, those 10 years would never have unfolded the way it did without just extraordinary respect for listening. Now many of these people were theologians and that's probably correlated to that. Excellent. Um, you spoke earlier about uh, actually the very beginning of your remarks, how we are essentially in a, in a war. Right? We can frame this as a war against the pandemic, against economic inequality, 
against social injustice, against all the very environmental uh, uh, or seeming environmental collapse. Um, and you also spoke about why uh, 233 years ago, the, uh, and the, the parallel to today, how the, the constitution is under attack. There's a war against the constitution and, mm -hmm. and there's no time to lose. And on the other hand, in terms of the inner life of leaders, there is a, a reality of exhaustion, right? Of, of mm -hmm. tiredness. Um, how do we, uh, you know, combat, uh, how do we fight against that uh, sense of exhaustion? Mm -hmm. Right, and, 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 I, and I want to also remind uh, uh, the listeners about parts of your book, how you speak uh, about uh, Lincoln uh, and Shackleton as you know, the, a lot of the pacing they did. The, the, and, and the fact that they were, not, they were notorious poor sleepers during the crisis. So yeah. how do we reconcile that and what do we do to not waste any time? So let me take the first one, the, the, the exhaust, let me take exhaustion factor. Um, we, we're tired. Leader, uh, lots and lots of people in crisis are tired. Winston Churchill was tired by May 30th, 1940, and it was just beginning. Um, but, but, but the stakes are too high. We have to rest up each day. That's part of the, part of the reason I want people to experiment with literally making your own mental health part of your leadership day is because I want people to not, not cave in to the pessimism and disillusionment and ennui that comes with exhaustion, right? They're all wrapped up together. So uh, the, the, the clearer headed we are, the better slept we are, right? The more recover we have 20 minutes every day, the more likely we are to say, let's go. Okay, I made these calls say now I'm going over here to get the vote out over here. Now I'm going over here to figure out how I can donate some food to this food bank. That and each of those steps, see, once you take the first action, that actually fuels you. So it's not about well, we've done so much and we're exhausted. It's that things look so things can look so dark. Hence the need to be very, very diligent about not Addict, being addicted to the news, being able to apportion our news intake from trustworthy sources and not keep turning when we get anxious to the New York Times front page or the Washington Post front page. But, but it, what, it, isn't the, it isn't the action that tires us. It's the sense that the mountain is so big ahead of us or we've already come so far. And those, those, those images have to be, in a sense, put in this room and the door shut. And then we have to realize but if we don't do it now, we won't have another chance. That's how high the stakes are right now around the next 47 days. That's how high they are. And I'm, I'm only a tiny person saying that among a sea of much more important and influential people. But we all know that to be the case. That's partly why we're anxious. So we can't, we can't, we actually just have to find a way to say the stakes are too high, which is what each of these leaders said every time they wanted to dive off the cliff of despair and doubt and exhaustion and say, I'm done. And what brought them back was the power of the mission and the, and, the, and the extraordinary elevated nature of the stakes. We are no different from they. Wonderful. I'll wrap it up with a question so that we can uh, let the, the, the audience uh, ask questions. But uh, this one leads to uh, your concept of focus. And, and specifically, uh, as you're now describing the, the current crisis, how daunting it can be, uh, uh, it sounds to me as if you, the, the, when you talk about apportionment and taking those incremental steps is ultimately about focusing on the next task. Yeah. And I love your concept of focus. And if you could just expand on it of uh, uh, conceding the unimportant and yeah. focusing on what's important. So let me say two quick things. This is important. It's a great question. I'm glad you brought it up. And I wish I'd incorporated it here. First, um, you have all every leader I've ever studied that, that I thought was, you know, a real leader, like I defined it, someone who could help you achieve it, a, a, an ordinary person who made them ca themselves capable of an extraordinary thing. Let's stay, with, stay there. Every leader I've ever studied had the self-discipline to turn away from all the ap ap all the worst case scenarios, all the world is ending, all the Armageddon. 
Even Dietrich Bonhoeffer in prison in 1944 by the Nazis turned away from the worst case scenarios in order to take the next step forward toward a more likely outcome. It's the first thing, turn away. When you start seeing that stuff on social media, shut your phone off or, or, or wipe away the Twitter app for, for now because that's not helping you. That's only feeding exhaustion, ennui, and encroaching despair or disillusionment. Second thing, more, even more important, Lincoln learned as a lawyer, he said this in a great law lecture that I won't repeat for you um, much as I'd like to, uh, that, that, you, that every case never hinged on more than three things. And all you, your job of a good trial lawyer was to get the jury to focus on those three things, one, two, or three. It's never more. And by the way, in any given day, in any given week, there's three important things that a leader must accomplish any given day and everything else needs in a sense to just kind of go be discriminated against in, and, and put on the back burner because saying no to the less important stuff, we all know what it is, but our phones have made us lazy and have made us addicted to the idea that everything is of equal importance because that's what's fed to us in that way. There is no discrimination on an iPhone. There's no filtering for, filtering for worth or importance or dignity or honor. So we have to be our own filters. One, two, or three things. Saying no to all the other stuff is actually saying yes to one, two, or three. This is a habit. I've learned this. This is a habit. You, everyone can do this, but you have to be willing to try it hard for three days and say no. Thank you. I think so much. So, um, Manuel, that was great. I appreciate your very thoughtful questions. And Nancy, once again, thank you so much for uh, so much advice packed into such a short little period of time. We very much appreciate it. Um, we had a couple questions that were submitted in advance on the registration page and then a couple more tonight through Q&A. So um, given the time, we'll, we'll handle a couple of them. Some one that was submitted ahead of time, Nancy, is from Nicole and Wilmette. And she asks, how can I best support my teenagers at this moment in history to help position themselves emotionally? That's a great question. So first thing is talk to them about the seismic nature of the event. It's difficult, but they're living through something they're gonna remember for the rest of their lives. And that, and if you look at other crises, the Second World War, um, the Great Depression in America, these were events that our parents said made them stronger, made them better, made them more broad looking, right? Gave them more, more of a sense of purpose about their own lives. So these are great chances to, you know, grow up quickly, but grow into a, a, a more resilient and more courageous and more defined person than we would in more normal circumstances. And, 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 and they can help themselves do that, right, day by day, including getting involved, getting involved in a political campaign, getting involved in the neighborhood, a community organization. This is the time to really grow into your own strength because they will recognize that crises can shape you but you have to say, I want to get shaped. I want to get stronger. I want to be more defined. Okay, another question that was submitted in advance from Julia and Wilmette. Uh, so shifting a little bit, and of course, this will be a sweet spot for you, Nancy, which is um, please comment and offer some perspective on how to weather uh, job transitions. A lot of people are obviously going through that right now and shifting and pivoting, whether um, in many ways. So if you have some thoughts on that. Uh, well, it yeah, so a couple of thoughts. First, I've been at the Harvard Business School for 28 years, and so I've seen a lot of careers, right, of, of all kinds of shapes and sizes, and lots of, in lots of different organizations. Um, the average, you know, the average job tenure or length of time has been shrinking massively across industries, across sectors, across uh, organizations for a long, long time. So the fact that we're learning to pivot right now with more speed and more dislocation and disruption and anxiety is actually in some, is, as hard as it is, it's actually making us more ready for the, for, for the turbulence in the post COVID world, which was there before COVID came to us. So we're in a sense on kind of special forces training when we have to switch jobs so quickly now and it's hard. But but it was it's been it's been happening in in a slightly slower speed for some time. So you go, walk in proudly, learn as much as you can. None of it will be for naught. All of it will be useful to you as you go forward. Okay, great. And then um, I'm going to give a quick reminder that uh, for those of you who have registered for the after hours or have purchased a book through the bookstall, when we conclude this webinar, we'll be opening up that um, that 
Zoom meeting, probably within three or four minutes after we conclude this, we'll have a quick bio break and then we'll start. So the last question was from during the event uh, tonight from Ann Harvey and she asks, how do we give people um, how do we give people to, I mean, we should meant an occasion to evolve. It seems we are a culture of wanting it now. Yeah, that's, see, that's really, I'm a historian, so I always want to do my little tiny part to help people realize that no one gets to be who they're meant to be, right, because we downloaded an app or because, right, there was a crisis and so we woke up different or because we, you know, got on, went to this health club. It, what I can tell you with, with just extraordinary confidence is that we are made into who we're meant to be day by day and footstep by footstep. But the most important element of that making is our willingness to try and get better. And after you hit, this will, this will kind of surprise some people on the call, after you hit about 50, people are either going another bifurcated distribution in one of two ways. They're either getting larger in spirit, in luminosity, in commitment, in sense of purpose, or they're actually getting smaller. Right? And, they're, and they're trying to figure out how to grab something they thought they had when they were 25 or 35. And that does not change. That, 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 that continues and those, those people grow far apart. So help your, help your people and, and, and the people that look to you, including your children, understand that we're made every single day and that, that, that making, that showing up each day and trying to get even the tiniest bit better are acts of leadership unto themselves. Very good. Thank you so much, Manuel. Thank you so much, Nancy. Welcome. Thank you so much for your service to FAN. It's been an incredible run, um, both from the summer and this event. We're so grateful for everything. My you pleasure. Do. And for uh, FAN audience, thank you so much for showing up.